Hey, up. Right, I've been doing a lot of um, soul searching recently. There are a few things that have come to my attention um, over the last few months that have been bothering me. You know, that feeling that something isn't right, there's something very wrong with the UK and, in fact, the rest of the world at the moment. Now, I want to make it clear from the start that the contents of this video are just my opinion or my interpretation of what's going on. In a way, I'm asking you for your views on this situation because I'm not a human rights lawyer. Um, you know, I can read. I've got a reasonable mind. And I can apply that reason of mind to, you know, the situation around us and what's written in law. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm correct. And I have to make that disclaimer because I have a feeling that maybe this video will be demonetized or maybe even taken down. And I should point out that even if adverts are playing on or during this video, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been demonetized because a few months ago YouTube changed the uh, terms and conditions whereby even if your video isn't monetized, they can monetize it and claim all the money from the adverts. Now, I think we all have a reasonable idea as to what our rights as humans are. And when it comes to net zero policies, we often compare that with what we perceive our rights to be and think, you know, doesn't this go against my rights as a human being a little bit? About three weeks ago, I came across um, a report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which is um, an independent charity that reports on the state of poverty and public health here in the UK. And it was a report that was published last year regarding the situation for sort of poverty and public health here in the UK in 2022. What originally grabbed my attention about this was that... Um, Certain illnesses or health conditions were on the rise. Health conditions that I thought had been eradicated a hundred years ago. Scurvy, um, a vitamin C deficiency. And rickets, um, I mean, I, I thought that had been completely eradicated from the UK. Both of these conditions are deemed to be related to malnutrition. And from what I can gather the rise in incidence of these conditions being reported had pushed the numbers up to something like four times what it had previously been here in the UK. But the figure that really shocked me was that they discovered that something like 14 million people here in the UK are living in poverty. This is UK in 2024, well, 2022. That's one in five people living in this country live in poverty. Now, the official government figures for that year were 11 million, still a horrific figure, but substantially lower than the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's findings, and I suppose it's not really in the government's best interests to um, report current figures. And I am suspicious that the mayor have sort of trimmed the figures a little bit. As I've said, that's just my opinion. And my justification for thinking that way is that I read some other independent thoughts which um, were around about the 14 million figure or just slightly under. They certainly went as low as the government's official figures. Now, the reasons put forward for this rise in poverty and poor health was the ridiculous rise in the cost of living here in the UK, in fact, all around the world, much of which can be traced back to net zero policies. I know the government gives us all sorts of reasons, you know, Russia's actions in the Ukraine, it's not our fault, but the problem is the precarious situation that we're in for the production of energy in this country stems from green policies whereby we've relinquished all rights to our sources of energy here in the UK, gas, coal, oil. We've sold them off to other countries and then we buy them back. And this complicates matters because world prices then affect what we pay for it when we buy it back. 
we've lost the independence of the production of those resources and with that loss of independence we've lost the ability to produce it cheaply and the rising cost for fuel and energy obviously has a knock-on effect to every other aspect of our lives food production transportation of goods it has a knock-on effect to all of those that push the prices up that's created what we know as the cost of living crisis now strictly speaking this situation arose before net zero became a thing but these were policies that were put into place because of pressure from so-called green think tanks and pressure groups like the green energy levy a lot of people are not aware of this but around about 24 percent of the price that you pay for gas and electricity taking things like vat out of the equation is a green tax levied by the government upon energy companies an amount of money levied to be put towards green initiatives for the future now you don't see this on your bill because this is a tax levied upon the energy producer but of course they just factor that into the cost of the gas and electricity you pay for so it's you that's paying it no one else yet another financial mechanism that is pushing people into poverty I've said in many videos in the past that these green policies are anti-human policies and this is one of the clear examples of that as far as I'm concerned. And the question that I keep asking myself is, you know, bearing in mind that we have human rights, how is this legal? Now, I know a lot of people are wondering what the hell I'm talking about here. This is a motorcycle channel. Well, actually, it's not. It's always been registered as a motoring and travel channel. And I will be getting onto that in a few moments, but my brain doesn't just work on that level, it takes everything in, and this is all part of the same thing. Now, just to clarify who has human rights, we're always being told that these sort of green policies and net zero policies are there to protect future generations. Well, strictly under law, they have no human rights until they are born and are independent of the mother for life sustainment. So although that may be a noble sentiment, it has no basis in law. Now I'm going to leave um, a link to this. This is the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. It is enshrined in law by all those countries that are signed up to it. UK is one of them. So is Europe and the United States. Now, I am cherry-picking bits out of it, so, you know, by all means, go along and read the entire document for yourself. Actually, it's not that big, it's only five minutes reading. Article 25 states that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care and necessary social services. Now, one thing I will say about this straight away, the Roundtree report pointed out that our government has habitually cut social services down in this country, whilst at the same time expanding the amount of money that it spends on net zero measures. So is that action an abuse of our human rights? And of course, the question has to be asked is that if green policies and net zero policies are reducing the standard of living for more and more people with each passing year in this country, is that an abuse of our human rights? Because if people are unable to afford food of adequate nutrition to keep them healthy, and they're unable to keep the houses warm in the winter because of the cost of energy, I think we're falling short. Now, let's get on to travel and our freedom of movement. Now, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights was first put into force in 1948 to address the atrocities of World War II. The internal combustion engine, the motor car and the motorcycle, had been around for about 50 years at that point. And this declaration was again looked at in 1976 and made more robust. By that time, motorised transport was commonplace. It was an accepted mode of transport for your average person.
Article 13 states that everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Freedom of movement. My interpretation of that is that the individual has the right to move around within their country or state unencumbered and unmolested. The internal combustion engine was the standard mode of getting around in 1976 for most people. So I don't believe that that can be excluded from this. Article 23, Part 1. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favourable conditions of work and protection against unemployment. Now, I take that to sort of coincide with the previous article. You're free to choose what job you take, whatever location that job happens to be in. So you need the freedom of movement to be able to travel to work that suits you and fits in with your circumstances. Some people have to travel quite large distances in order to get to their place of employment. I often hear people railing against those who have to travel long distances. The thing is, they don't have to justify it. It's an inalienable human right to be able to work wherever they choose to work. That is their human right. It's not a matter for other people, even the government, to dictate to them how far they travel to work. Which, of course, brings us on to the question of electric vehicles. Now, Electric vehicles, or EVs as we know them, first came about in the 1830s. They went through about 70 years of development. They didn't have very good ranges, they were awkward to refuel, and by and large, they were quite impractical vehicles to run. So, about the turn of the last century, the internal combustion engine, which was far more convenient to use, took over and pushed EVs into obsolescence. Now, in the last three or four years, in the push for net zero, the EV has been sort of dragged out of mothballs and it's been pushed in front of us as new technology, as the future. And a lot of people believe EVs are new technology. They're not. They're obsolete technology, which has been dragged out of mothballs and politically reinvented and presented to us as a replacement for the internal combustion engine in order to save the planet and reduce CO2 emissions and everything else. It's a flawed, obsolete technology that is not much better than it was a hundred years ago. It's certainly less convenient and less time-saving than the internal combustion engine. It's much more expensive in every way, which again has an impact on the cost of living, and it makes the freedom of movement more difficult. The UK government and many other governments are forcing electric vehicles upon us, despite the shortcomings. They're giving us no choice in their adoption. But they are an obstacle to achieving Article 13, freedom of movement. And they're a barrier to Article 23, freedom of choice of employment. They make both of those human rights more difficult to achieve. Is that an infringement on our human rights? Right, I'm just going to play a little video to you now. Just watch this and listen to what this lady says. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Jet Laus, for the global business community, the top concern for the next two years is not conflict or climate. It is disinformation and misinformation, followed closely by polarization within our societies. These risks are serious because they limit our ability to tackle the big global challenges we are facing. Changes in our climate, and our geopolitical climate, shifts in our demography and in our technology. This was Ursula von der Leyen, uh, head of the European Union. At the 2024 Davos meeting of dignitaries, 
politicians, world leaders and elite business owners of the world. What she was complaining about there was the fact that the mainstream no longer has control over information. The news used to be drip-fed to us by the mainstream media, uh, newspapers, TV, radio, which has always been influenced by the government. The news, the truth, is what they tell us it is. But this has been undermined in recent years by people like me, to a lesser extent, and by other more prominent news sources on social media. And her problem is... That undermines their truth. Both the European Union and to some extent here in the UK, legislation has been mooted and in fact initiated to clamp down on freedom of speech. You see, net zero is controversial. It's unachievable. And if it is achievable, it will make no difference. It's full of holes. And they don't want people telling other people that because it undermines their goals. People like these get their own way with this kind of legislation. People like me and other people who want to express their opinions will be silenced. It will remove your choice as to where you get your information from. What does the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights have to say about that? Article 18 says that everyone has the right to freedom of thought. You have the right to think what you like, and you have the right to choose what you believe. It appears to me on the face of it, they want to make that choice for you. Then Article 19 follows up on that by saying that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference, and to seek receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So, if these governments do go ahead and silence opinions being broadcast through social media or any other channel, would they be infringing our human rights? Well, on the face of it, I would say yes, they would, because Article 30 says nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, group or person any right to engage in any activity or perform any act aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms set forth herein. So I would interpret that to mean that no government can override our human rights with any form of legislation that would inhibit our freedom of speech our ability to achieve a reasonable standard of living or our ability to freely travel around in a manner that's been established as being the norm for over half a century and in fact was the norm when this particular set of human rights was last examined, fortified and considered to be fit for purpose. So, I'll ask again, are these worldwide net zero policies interfering with your human rights. Now, there is just one potential fly in the ointment to this. In recent years, the United Nations has become embroiled in the, shall we say, ideology of human-induced climate change. They've seized upon it, and they are big proponents of net zero. Now, I believe this is outside of the remit of the original foundation of the United Nations. I don't really think it's any of their business, but they've made it their business. And there is one more article that might put a spanner in the works. Article 29, Part 3. I don't think it was really ever intended for this purpose, but I can see it being pressed into service to force some of these changes ahead. It says, these rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Now, when the um, United Nations came into being back in the 1940s, it was never envisioned that they were going to be dealing with things like climate change. 
climate change is an ideology that the United Nations has inserted itself into, in my opinion, without any authority from anyone else. This whole document was intended to ensure that everyone had rights and that those rights were observed, no matter what. But that Article 29 does appear to me to be something that could be used as a get-out-of-jail card, if you like, that would make a complete nonsense of human rights. Let me know what your opinions are in the uh, comments down below. One thing I would like to say quickly is that, yes, I know there are a lot of other things that I could have included in this video, but... You know, it's likely to run to an hour, an hour and a half, and I just wanted to keep things as concise as possible, so I've just chosen particular sort of parts of this that I think are pertinent to my viewers. It's not a matter of me not knowing about them or failing to t take them into account or mention them. It's just a matter of I am limited to what I can put into these videos. Right, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and my other videos and in doing so helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate it. I would also appreciate it if you would leave a like and consider becoming a subscriber to this channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can assist this channel in other ways via my Patreon page or via the uh, Super Thanks button down below. Either way, it's much appreciated. I will, of course, be back next week, so until then, please ride safely, and I'll see you soon.